Good morning. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. Yes. All right. Our call to worship this morning is from Isaiah chapter 25. Uh, and then I'm going to read another passage. Uh, and each time I say Christ is risen, please respond with he's risen indeed. All right. So from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food and marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And from the reproach of his people, he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So to all who are weary and need rest, Christ is risen. To all who mourn and long for comfort, Christ is risen. To all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. To all who fail and desire strength, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. To all who sin and need a Savior, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. The church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, who came, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, and three days later was raised from the dead that he would be the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable and the friend of sinners. Church Christ is risen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that Christ has been raised. Lord, thank you for the truth that uh, the curse that covers us all, that covers the world, is in the process of being pulled back, that that veil is being removed that we can look to that and trust that one day all things will be made right. Uh, the tears will be wiped from every eye. Uh, Father, help us to sing um, just joyfully and, and uh, in, in, uh, in gratitude to that, even as we uh, can acknowledge places where brokenness still exists in our world. Let us look forward with the hope of our own resurrection that we will share with Jesus. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by a heavy stone, Messiah still and all. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Christ is risen. Good to see lots of faces we know and lots of faces, lots of faces we don't know. Glad to have you here. The scripture reading this morning, it's in the Pew Bibles. It's on page 961, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. 
Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, although it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Stand and uh, let's stand and sing together as we uh, prepare for communion.
Amen. And on this uh, Easter morning, uh, we can say along with the words of that song, uh, you know, why should we gain from his reward? It is this great mystery um, that uh, of God's love for us. Uh, it's not anything that we have done. It's not any uh, hoops that we have jumped through, things we have accomplished, good things, good works we have done. It's not about that. It's about his great love for us and his reaching down to us through his son, Jesus, who gave up his life for you and for me. And so we're left these so many years later still asking the same question. Why should I gain from his reward, from what he has accomplished? But again, um, just like it was very mysterious that first Easter morning uh, when the apostles went to go see the empty tomb, uh, it was dark, they were tired, it was very confusing because there was no body there. And we can come in here 2,000 years later and celebrate because we know of the risen Savior. But at that point, it certainly was a real mystery as to what was going on. Um, but we know uh, we have the beauty of, of time and history to understand what happened that day. And uh, we know that Jesus gave up his life uh, for, for our sins. Uh, but also, he uh, was raised on the third day just as uh, God had planned. Because he conquered death. He conquered death for you, he conquered death for me, he conquered death for us all. And so we can have this relationship with God, we can have forgiveness of sin, um, we, we have eternal life in him because of what he has done. And when we come together as a church, every Sunday we gather around the table that's behind me, this is the communion table, uh, or the Lord's table. Uh, for Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he gathered his disciples around him, and he told them to do these things in remembrance of him. Now, they didn't, again, back then it was confusion. It was a mystery. They didn't know what he was talking about. But now we know. We know that he was going to give his body. It was going to be broken for us. His blood would be poured out for you and for me for the remission of our sins. And so uh, it's a beautiful story that we all uh, can take part in. But uh, he did this for us, uh, his family. For those who would believe in him, who would be called children of God, and we've been called out of the world, those of us who believe in Jesus, we've been called out of the world to be his disciples, but to be the child of God, so that makes us brothers and sisters with one another. And so when we share this time together of communion, uh, we're doing it together as a family. We're at the family table, as it were. We're celebrating that together. Before we do that this morning, I'd like for you to do something uh, individually, though. I'd like to, for you to go to the Lord. This is a time that uh, we do this every week. Uh, but let us go to Him. Uh, come confessing our sins to Him. If there's any uh, unconfessed sin in our life, we need to go to Him, confess those things. Not so that we can be punished, but so that we might receive the fullness of the forgiveness that Jesus has already brought. So let's confess our sins to Him, and let's take a moment to lay our burdens down at His feet. Every one of us carrying something uh, this Easter Sunday, things that we're worried about, um, let's lay those burdens down at his feet. He wants to take those from you as well. So let's take a moment to do uh, those two things before we gather around the table. These are the words the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, the church in Corinth uh, a long time ago, back in the first century. For I received from the Lord, but I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In just a moment, we will be uh, gathered around this table, proclaiming the Lord's death as the way of salvation for all people. And I want you to, uh, to know this morning that here at Hill Country Church, we observe what we call an open communion. And all that means is you do not have to be a member of this particular church uh, to share in this very special time together, this family time. We invite all believers uh, in the Lord Jesus to please come forward and, and share in this time. And here's how we're going to do things this morning. We'll stand up row by row, and then you'll come to the middle. And in the middle, we'll form two lines. Uh, when you come forward, you'll be given a piece of bread. Communion this morning will be by intinction, that is by dipping. So you'll take that piece of bread, dip it into the cup, partake, and then you'll go back to your seat around the outside. Um, again, if you're new today, we invite you to join with us. Uh, would you pray with me? Father God, we're so thankful for this time that we can come together to remember Yes, we remember the sacrifice of your son. Yes, we, we, we confess that it is not by our merit that we've been saved, but it's because of your great love. And it's by his broken body and shed blood alone that we find salvation. We find eternal life. We have a relationship with you. We have forgiveness for our sins. And Father, for that, we're very thankful this morning. But we also come celebrating knowing that this was all not just talk, but this was real. That Jesus died for our sins and was raised from the dead on the third day. And that we celebrate today. Father, thank you and we ask you to bless this very special time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Good morning again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Welcome again to all of you. If you are visiting and you'd like to know more about our church or interested in uh, someone contacting you, there is a tear-off sheet on the bulletin. You can fill that out. And also, if you have any prayer needs or physical needs or anything that the church can help with, please put it on there and put it in a box at the back so we can contact you. Uh, a few announcements this week. The men's uh, Tuesday morning Bible fellowship study is uh, having the pancake and sausage breakfast, so please come join us for that. That's at 7 a.m. in Holter Hall over on the other side of the classrooms. Um, there is a sign-up out in the uh, foyer for the men's retreat, which is uh, May 10th and 11th, I believe. And also for the Couples Connection class, which will be starting on April 21st. And there's some other announcements in the bulletin here as well, so please take a look at those. A uh, couple things going on uh, as far as prayers this week in church. Uh, Josie Phillips, Daniel, and Mary Phillips, uh, youngest one, is in the hospital right now with bronchitis, low oxygen numbers. And Daniel said she's doing okay, but anyway, we, uh, she's in the hospital and she's a little one, so be sure and keep her in your prayers. We uh, lost Winnie Heidenreich this week. She went to join the Lord and her husband Chuck, who died about five years ago, and uh, she, her body was laid to rest yesterday, and so keep her family in your prayers. Um, also, for a lot of you may know here in the community, Steve McAnally, who passed away tragically this past week, and be sure to keep his family in your prayers as well. Um, Let's go to the Lord in prayer for just a few minutes. Father God, we're so thankful to be here this morning. We're thankful for this full church and all these faces we don't recognize. Uh, just such a blessing to be able to celebrate this morning uh, the resurrection that you have provided for your son, Jesus Christ, uh, and his death to cleanse us from our sins or give us salvation that we are so undeserving of. Father. We're thankful when we lift all of this uh, and all of our efforts and all of our lives to your glory this morning. Father, bless those in our church who are ailing and friends and community members as well. Uh, Father, we ask you to bless our community this week as we prepare for the influx of visitors for the eclipse, especially be with those in the first responders, the police, the fire, the service workers, the ho I mean, the hospital staff and, and all who will uh, certainly receive a great influx of, of uh, work involved with all of that and be with them, give them safe passage, help them to be able to get to the folks that need help um, and just be, be, watch over our community this coming week. Father, we're so thankful for being able to worship here with you this morning. Uh, we ask you to uh, just to open our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning through Rob's message uh, and um, keep in our hearts always this week as we go throughout our week the salvation that you have provided. We thank you for all these things and Father we ask you to, uh, or we offer this all to you Father in the name of your Son Jesus Christ, Amen. Thank you, Jamie. So good to see everyone here this morning on this beautiful Easter morning. Um, when we left here Friday, it was uh, at night. Um, if you came here to the Tenebrae service, uh, we left in darkness and uh, we had turned all the lights out. That's the way it was. 
uh, because it represented a man in a tomb. Represented a man in a tomb. That's where we left the biblical story anyway. At our service here, we, we read of Jesus' betrayal and arrest and, and Peter's uh, thrice denying him, his trial, his crucifixion, his death, his burial. And here's how we left it on Friday. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So there was darkness, and there was death, and uh, that was the end of the story, right? And uh, you might say if it was a movie, that's when you'd, you'd roll the credits because this story is over. The Jesus movement was over. His followers, uh, they scattered. His followers went into hiding. Uh, there weren't many of them, by the way. Believe it or not, there was a time when Jesus was very popular. But by this time in his life, uh, most of the people that were fans of his had, had left because their leader this traveling preacher and miracle worker named Jesus, and, and he was from a little bitty nothing of a town called Nazareth. Well, he was now dead and buried. They had a lot of hope in him, but now he's dead, and that's the end of the story. Only it wasn't. It wasn't the end at all. Instead, the events that we read on Good Friday, they ushered in uh, the hope that death can be conquered and that there really is a God and, and He really does love the world and He really did give His only begotten Son so that whoever believes in Him may not perish but have everlasting life. It's all true. It's all true. And this morning, I'm here to tell you that we can have and be confident in this hope because of an empty tomb and a risen Savior. I'm sure you've asked it before, or you've heard it asked, maybe. Uh, the question, why is it called Good Friday? Now, I know today is Easter Sunday. Uh, we're past Good Friday, uh, but we still have questions about that day. Why is it called Good uh, if that's the day that Jesus died? Well, to answer that question, we have to know the rest of the story. It's good because although he did die, he rose again, and he lives. We celebrate that today. And of course, the death he died, uh, he died for sin, and he died for sin once and for all, nailing our sins, not his, our sins to the cross so that we might be forgiven for everything that we've ever done, everything we've ever done wrong, everything that we will ever do in our whole lives, and we will have abundant, everlasting life and reconciliation with God. That means we have a relationship with God, and I'd say that's pretty good. It is a good Friday, but it all means nothing without the resurrection. It all means nothing without the resurrection. If you continue reading that passage that Jamie read earlier from 1 Corinthians 15, you'll, you'll find this. Apostle Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. So, just like someone might ask about the importance of Good Friday, they might also ask, well, what's the big deal about Easter then? What is it exactly that we're celebrating today? And why is it so important? Well, we rejoice because even though we left Friday in darkness and with a dead man in a tomb, uh, this morning we return and we return to the light to find an empty tomb and a risen Savior to the glory of of God the Father. As for its importance, we can look again uh, at the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and straight from the passage that Jamie read earlier. He said, For I delivered to you as of first importance. 
what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He's given us a very simple gospel proclamation here. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. In other words, God had planned all of this. It was God's will that it be done. This is the good news. This is the gospel in its very simplest term. And this is why Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is such a big deal. What's interesting, however, is that the good news didn't seem so good at first. It seemed like someone rubbed salt in the wound of anyone who actually still followed Jesus. Very early on the first Easter morning, when it was still dark outside, and when people were very tired and sad and confused... The news sounded something like this, someone has added insult to our injury by stealing the body of Jesus from his tomb, the empty tomb, at least very early on, pointed to some sort of cruel joke. That's all they could think of. But now, of course, we know better. The empty tomb points to something else. It points to a risen and living Savior. Let's take a look at the story as John writes it, and we'll pick it up where where we left off on Good Friday. What looks so dark and dreary on, on Friday will be completely overwhelmed by the light of hope that we see here on Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. I invite you to open with me. If you've brought your Bible with you, you can open with me to the Gospel of John. We're in the Gospel of John, and I'm going to read from chapter 20. So John chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. And uh, if you want to borrow one of the Bibles in the pew racks in front of you, that would be fine. Uh, You'll find the passage on page 906 if you want to follow along with us. So John chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, says something like this. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Now, we got to remember that Jesus was crucified on Friday, and he was laid in the tomb that very same day. He was dead, and, and this was evident. Uh, we, this is why this detail was included uh, in the gospel writings, uh, evident by the blood and water that poured out of his side when they uh, stabbed, when he was pierced with a spear. And according to the gospel of Matthew, we know that the tomb was sealed So not only was he dead, and we're certain of this, uh, but they put him in a uh, tomb, and it was sealed shut. And there were actually guards posted there uh, to protect it so that none of Jesus' followers, no fanatics that were following Jesus, would be able to come in and take the body and claim that he was resurrected because they were worried about that. So there's a little bit of paranoia on the part of the uh, Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, But it actually shows us more proof that this actually happened. No one stole the body. No one stole the body because they they had taken extra care to make sure that wouldn't happen, that, that that couldn't happen. But nevertheless, when Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, the stone had been rolled away and there was no body there. And and her reaction is so very human. It's no doubt the same reaction that many of us would have. She thinks of the natural. She thinks of the natural world without a thought in the world of the supernatural. I think way too much of of our time is spent trying to figure out how the miracles of the Bible, including this one, could be explained by natural means. But this was no natural event. 
And it was different than any of the miracles that they had witnessed Jesus perform during his ministry. And Jesus had performed many miracles, nothing like this. Mary loved Jesus and she believed in him. Uh, she had a very close relationship with him. She believed him deeply, but she could not fathom what actually took place on that morning. So she runs back to Peter and, and to John and she yells out, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. You see, she immediately goes to the natural explanation that somebody stole the body. That's what we were worried about, and that's what happened. And, and then it says, and we don't know where they have put him. Her first reaction was to assume that somebody had stolen Jesus. It was almost as if she wanted to find the body. She's trying to solve this mystery uh, more than she believed in hope that Jesus had actually risen from the dead, which is what he said he would do. Now, to be fair, this must have been a very traumatic experience. I mean, I can't imagine the pain that she must have already been feeling now that this person who she had been following and developing a close relationship with, who had, had driven demons from her, who loved her, she had placed all of her faith in this man, all the hope that she had in the world was in this man, and now he was dead. And he died a, a, a common criminal's death. It was very ugly, very embarrassing. So already she's mourning from that, wondering what she had just spent the last few years of her life doing, and then she finds out that someone had come and added insult to her injury by stealing his body. It must have been so demoralizing. But soon she would realize that it was, it was not a theft at all. It was the greatest miracle of all time. So with Mary's news, uh, Peter and John took off for the tomb to find out what was going on. They're going to go uh, solve this mystery. Uh, by the way, John cleverly refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. And we kind of all laugh at that nowadays and think, oh, doesn't he think a lot of himself? But in actuality, it's believed that uh, he didn't refer to himself by name on purpose, and it was out of humility. because He didn't want uh, to be known by his name. So he left it in there as the one who Jesus loved. But then again, he certainly points out who ran faster. <laughs> so it says that he and Peter were both running, but the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, John, he outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So decide for yourself, I guess, if he's humble. But it's, it's really funny to me, I think, that uh, God has a sense of humor and it's recorded for us here. But this is a great little detail. It is a great little detail, all kidding aside. It leads credence to the, to the trustworthiness of the story. This is an eyewitness account, and if he could remember such a minute detail, then the bigger picture events must be true recollections as well. John, who was there that day, it happened to him, uh, and he's thinking back, and he even remembers who outran who on the way to the tomb. But it's interesting also that uh, these guys had no idea what was going on. We think real highly of Peter and John and, you know, the, the disciples. We think highly of them, but they had no idea. For it says up to now, they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. So they, they were really running to see uh, about this foul play that Mary spoke of. They're trying to find out if it was actually true. Surely it couldn't be true. Somebody couldn't steal the body. But then they, they arrive and they examine the tomb themselves. It says that John, who arrived first, he stooped down to look in. He didn't go in, but he stooped down to look inside that tomb, and he saw the linen cloths just lying there. Those were the burial clothes, the ones they wrapped Jesus in. They were there, but the body was not. And the word here uh, for see, at least this first time, is the Greek word blepe, which means to see clearly. It just means to see, like physically with your eyes. John saw with his eyes. He clearly saw this. His, his eyes weren't fooling him. And it's followed by Peter, who, who actually went into the tomb. So he gets there later, but then he goes right past John. He goes right into the tomb to get a closer look. It says that he saw also, but it's a different word. 
Theore is the word, Theore. He saw the linen cloths lying there. Different word. And this one means to view attentively, to, to discern, like to examine, to investigate, to find out by seeing, to find out by seeing, which is exactly what Peter did. He found out by seeing. Unbelievably, he found out by seeing the, the burial clothes lying there that something had indeed happened. But this was odd because if, if someone had come and, and, and stolen the body, uh, why would they have bothered taking off all the burial clothes? That makes no sense at all. And why would they have done it in such an orderly fashion, even folding up the face cloth very nicely? There's something different going on here. The clothes were just lying there as if the body had, had evaporated out of them. There was no grave robbery. This was a miracle. And we as readers, we begin to perceive this along with John, who, who finally went in uh, after Peter. It says he went into the tomb, but this time he saw and he believed. Now, this is another word, a different word for saw in the Greek. The word used here is aden. It's a form of horao. And in this case, it means to see with the mind or to, to understand, to understand the significance of something. So it's a little different than just seeing with the eyes, not just I saw this. Now, we might say it's at this point that John got it. He saw and he believed. And this is the first time. He still didn't totally get it because he didn't understand the scriptures, as it says here, that Jesus must rise from the dead. Um, but he saw enough to believe. John didn't understand everything, but he knew something was different here and, and that God had done this. And it was at this point that he realized Jesus was not there uh, and he was not stolen. He was alive. His body hadn't just disappeared. He had risen but I ask you this morning, what do you think? What do you believe? This is the ultimate question, really, because if this is a true account of what happened that day, then, then it has ramifications for our lives. This is not just about the disciples who were there that day and saw it firsthand. It has ramifications for all of our lives. This is not something that we can just say, uh, huh, Jesus was crucified, and he died, and then was raised from the dead. What a wonderful story, and, and, he, and he still lives, and that's interesting too, but I think I'll just go on with my life as if it's no big deal. Listen, I know there are people in this room who don't believe it happened, and I could go on and on with reasons to believe. I could have spent all morning this morning talking about reasons to believe, but, but I know that there were people also uh, back at, at the same time this happened, and they saw these things, and at the very least, they heard them from eyewitness accounts. They, they knew what had happened. They saw it with their own eyes, perhaps, and, and the accounts were firsthand accounts, and, and those people still didn't believe. That's because it's human nature. That's human nature. Think about doubting Thomas. He was one of the twelve, and he later appears in this chapter uh, because and he's very prominent because he wouldn't believe in the resurrected Christ unless, so I, I can't believe, unless I can see the nail wounds in his hands from when they nailed uh, nails through them and he, and, and he could put his fingers in them and then and also place his hand in the side where they had pierced Jesus. Unless he can do that, he couldn't believe. But then Jesus showed up. And he allowed him to do just that. And somehow there are those, there were those back then, there are those today who just need more proof or something. But I want you to know this morning that this book is trustworthy and true. Listen to the words of Jesus who told Thomas in that same passage when Thomas doubted. He said, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. That's what he told Thomas. Thomas then got to see the risen Jesus 
face to face, and, and he did see those nail-pierced hands, and he did put his hand into the side, into the wound of, of Jesus. But there is a blessing also for those who believe without seeing these things, only seeing with the mind's eye, only seeing and believing Understanding the significance. As Jesus himself said, you believe, he told Thomas, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. And then there are those who read this story over and over and we hear it every Easter and we believe it, we believe every word of it, but do we believe enough of it to live by it? Is there evidence? Is there evidence in our lives of belief in the resurrection? Because this is a life-changing thing, this one event that happened so long ago. We need to not just believe it happened, but we need to fully understand the significance. The resurrection means that He lives. He continues to live. He continues to intercede for us. That means He prays for us. He is able to save those who come to Him in faith. The resurrection shows us the new life that He intends us to walk in. We need to reckon ourselves dead to sin. That is the old life and alive to Him, the resurrected Jesus Christ. The resurrection is the proof. It's the receipt, if you will, for God's work in saving us. And the resurrection asks us to look ahead because one day we will be resurrected as well. Later in that passage that Jamie read from 1 Corinthians, it says this, He is the first of a great harvest. This is Jesus. Jesus is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So His resurrection is an example for us of what is, lies ahead for us. He's conquered death, not only for Himself, but for us as well. Belief in the resurrection is life-changing. All you need to do is, is read the book of Acts. I encourage you to do that. Take some time this week uh, to read through that book. It's a very interesting story of the the, the early church. Because all these guys who went into hiding, uh, because when Jesus was was killed, they all went into hiding and behind closed and locked doors. Uh, They're scared to death because they were afraid and, and ashamed that they had followed this Jesus and he had let them down. Well... They go from that shame and being scared to being emboldened when they believed in the power of the resurrection. It was a a total game changer. It was a life changer. And they went all over the world and faced all kinds of persecution. It didn't matter. To preach the good news of Jesus because it was that real, that life changing. So, what do we believe becomes a valid question for all of us. Let me read on because the story continues, and I want, I want to look at one more person, one more experience. Uh, beginning at verse 11, it says this, But Mary uh, stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Je- Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. So we've seen the story of Peter and John um, and their examination of the tomb. And here we find another. Mary Magdalene also uh, coming to stoop down to look into the tomb. And she's weeping. And she's tired. 
and she's beside herself with grief. She's scared. Uh, she's a little angry, perhaps, and very disappointed. But unlike Peter and John, she sees something else in that tomb. She didn't even notice the burial clothes. There's no mention of them there. Because she was so overwhelmed by the two angels in white. I don't blame her, as I would be too, if you walked up to a tomb and found these angels sitting in there. Can you imagine that sight? Angels in white, and then they, they spoke to her. Yet she doesn't seem too awestruck or too fearful. She had been through a lot. But they point her to the truth. They have a message for her. And that's what they are. They are messengers. That's what angel means. That's what a messenger or what an angel is. They are messengers. Woman, why are you weeping? And she said, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. Again, she's just sensing the, the natural. They've stolen him, taken him somewhere. They, who are they? We don't know. Even though John had seen and believed, she still has no idea what happened. But then everything changes because Jesus shows up. She sees him, but she doesn't recognize him. And again, I'm not sure why. A lot of this is a mystery to me too. But again, this whole passage is about seeing and and perceiving and understanding and believing and how there's, there's differences there. It says she turned around and saw Jesus. That is, the word is theore. That should sound familiar. Same word used in the part where Peter went in and examined the burial clothes up close. So she can see him all right, up close, personal, but she can't discern that it's Jesus she's talking to. So she doesn't believe, at least for the moment. She doesn't understand the significance of Jesus alive, standing right next to her. He says, dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And she thinks he's the gardener. So clearly she sees. Didn't miss it that he was there. He wasn't an apparition. She sees him up close and personal, but there, there's still something missing in her mind. She's not seeing as to understand the significance. This is not the gardener. He's not a mere man at all. Uh, this is the risen Lord Jesus. She needed to have her eyes opened, which seems to happen when he calls her by name. And this is such a wonderfully touching passage of Scripture. All Jesus says is, Mary calls her by name and she at this she turns and she understands and she sees she calls him rabboni which means teacher and that's what they would call him it was spurgeon uh who once said jesus can preach a perfect sermon in one word and that's all it took it's just what he does here it's all he needed to say was to call her by name she opened her eyes and she saw, she understood, she believed. Uh, there is no better evidence of this fact than when she went to report the news, which she does immediately. She goes to report the news to the disciples, and, and she herself gave the shortest but most profound Easter sermon ever given, I have seen the Lord. That's all she says to them. There's a lot here, just even in this short statement. The word she uses is eorakim. Heo rockin. It's a form of horao, and that's the same word used when, when John saw and believed. So she's not simply making a statement about seeing the risen Lord physically, even though that was absolutely true. She saw him with her eyes, that sort of a thing. But she also saw him in the sense that she understood everything. She understood the significance of it all. She knew, she believed, there, there, there was no going back. Her life was changed, and now she's bringing this good news to the others. Again, friends, this is the question for us this morning, this, so many years later. What do we believe? Do, do we see? Do we understand the significance of what we're reading here, what is being told Mary was the first person to see and hear and touch the risen Savior. 
This is a, what a great privilege, by the way. Let's take a moment to appreciate that. This is a great privilege given to a person who had a, a broken life. That's how you could describe her. She had had a broken life, but she experienced healing in Jesus. And now she's going to be changed forever. The resurrection is like that. It is life-changing. And for anyone who has experienced brokenness in this life, there is wholeness and healing available to you too. In Jesus, in the power of His resurrection, it really does change everything. This morning, there is an empty tomb and there is a risen Savior to the glory of God the Father. The question is, do we see them? Do we see them? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for that empty tomb. We thank you that Jesus not only came and died for our sins, making a relationship with you possible, giving us forgiveness, eternal life, all these wonderful things, but he backed it up by being raised from the dead and still living, Father, being our Savior, our living Savior. Father, we're, 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 we're amazed by this story. Help us to be amazed by it, Father. Help us to walk in it, the truth of it, and, and let it affect our lives. Let it change our lives, Father, that we might walk with boldness as followers of you because of what happened so many years ago, knowing that the power of the resurrection uh, exists today and that we can have that power by believing in you. And so, Father, we're thankful for these things. And uh, thank you for your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing with as much gusto as we've ever had. Let's sing it like we've never had before. The doxology. Praise God from home all blessings flow. Praise Him. benediction this morning. Go in peace and joy as witnesses of the risen Lord. Have a great day and a great week.